That could come in handy. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to talk today about Holy Spirit backbone. Uh, that is something we desperately need in this day and always have from the time uh, the Holy Spirit first came upon this earth. And we're going to be looking at a large portion of scripture today. Uh, actually, when we uh, were studying uh, the book of Samuel, last, 1 Samuel last year, uh, we covered that story of David and Goliath. And it's quite a bit different than those of us remember it when we, if we grew up in Sunday school and saw the little flammable stories and saw little David and his slingshot and the big bad Goliath and all that stuff. We're going to see that this young man, a teenager more than likely, uh, has some lessons to teach all of us about Holy Spirit backbone, boldness in the Lord. And uh, we're going to be covering almost 50, 50 some verses. So we've got a lot of scripture today. And hopefully, people, this will not be your main feeding, as uh, Rick alluded to just a short while ago. Uh, you know, we're covering a lot of scripture today, but uh, we need to feed on it every day. So let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Father, as we get ready to come to your word, we pray, Lord, you open our hearts and our minds and our spirits, Lord, to willingly receive this and to apply it to our lives, Lord, that we be not only hearers of your word, but, Lord, doers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you want to follow along your own Bibles, we're in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter today. 1 Samuel 17, and beginning in verse 1. I'll give you a second to turn there. 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sacco in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Demon between Sacco and Ezekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. So, We'll pause here a moment to say that uh, the battle plans in those days were different than modern warfare. We, we kind of uh, remember that or can think back to films that would show, you know, the north and the south, you know, the, the men in gray and the men in blue, and they come at each other. Same with the Revolutionary War, the British forces, where they just kind of be on each side and then boom, like, like football teams in a way. And uh, the Israelites have been having a chronic problem with the Philistines. You know, they, this has gone on for decade, dec after decade, after decade. And, and that can be that way in our own lives. Sometimes we face enemies. It would be lovely if when we have an issue, it was just lasted a day or a couple of days. But I'm sure everybody in here knows what it's like to face difficulties and, and enemies uh, for a long, long, long time. So these uh, Philistines have been a pain in the patootie of the Israelites for quite a while. And in these times of facing enemies, people, that's when we really need Holy Spirit backbone. Picking up in verse 4, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. Mm. That's taller than Tim back there. That's tall. <laughs> By a lot. You know, I'm 6'2", I'm and when I have to, like if I give Tim a hug, it's like... <laughs> I'm not used to but nine feet, over nine feet tall. But the men who had gone up with him, uh, we see in Numbers 13, uh, pausing there for a moment, uh, there were uh, people in that day, uh, a whole tribe of people that were large in size, giants basically. And we read in Numbers when the Israelites sent the spies into uh, the, the Promised Land, it says in Numbers 13, 31, but the men who had gone up with him, that is Caleb and Joshua, said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites an evil report or a bad report. Now remember when we were talking about the ton a few weeks ago, we said that whenever you're, you are inclined to get negative about life or about your situation, uh, that's bad. But the God, God says negative talk is evil talk. And I want to, just want to give that review for you. Uh, so they, they had a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. 
We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Enoch came from Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. So uh, Goliath may well have been uh, a descendant of these people. Uh, picking up in verse 5, continuing to uh, describe who Goliath was, he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. That's his armor weighed 125 pounds. So needless to say, when Goliath attended Weight Watchers, <laughs> he didn't wear the armor. Because I would add a lot. So, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks, oh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 6, on his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. That's 15 pounds. Just the point of the spear weighed 15 pounds. Now, just to illustrate that this morning, uh -oh. I brought in, I got a no expense for visual aids. <laughs> 15 pounds, people. This is 15. That's what, this is what his spear weight. So I want, I want to have one or two of you come up here and just lift that, feel it. Come on, come on. Somebody get up. Oh, Scott has guts. He's going to get up and just feel how, how 15 pounds. Can you imagine the point of a spear? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a heavy sword. Yeah. Here, catch. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. That's bigger than the baby. The baby. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's way. And uh, now, anybody who needs some potatoes after the service, <laughs> I'm quite serious. Some of you may need. So Vicki Smith brought in vegetables a few weeks ago. Uh -huh. you know, at least we'll give you something healthy today. Yeah. So anyway, but but you really should before you leave today, you should come up and just lift that to get get an idea. And I'll tell you something. I really feel the Lord revealed to me this morning. This kind of strength. This man was over nine feet tall, and we hear about the weight. I think he got his strength from demonic powers. If you ever hear of somebody demon possessed, um, they have extraordinary strength. And I believe that this man was demon possessed. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, verse 8. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects and serve... Uh, we, uh, I'm sorry. We will become your subjects, but if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day... I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Now let me tell you something, people. Mm. Whenever you're attacked by the enemy, and I'm not talking about everyday problems. We all, Jesus said in the world, you'll have trouble, but cheer up, I've overcome the world. We're always going to have certain problems. But there are going to be times in your life where you are being attacked. And if you're spiritually sensitive, you'll recognize, the Lord will reveal to you, this is an attack of the enemy. And any time Satan or his minions uh, bring an attack into our life, it's defying what God has done in your life. Yeah. You know what that's like? You know, it'll, it'll play in your head. Uh, so in this day, uh, again, a different kind of a battle plan, uh, they would at times just have the strongest man from their camp fight the strongest man from the other camp. It would avoid, it would avoid a war. It would avoid, you know, all the cost and lives and things like that. But so Goliath is saying, just send somebody to fight with me. Yeah, you know, it's like a schoolyard fight. Remember the schoolyard fights? How many remember fights in school? Right? Usually it was two guys. You know, just all of a sudden you see there'd be a crowd gathering around. And once I remember one time it was two girls. You know, the hair, the pulling the hair. Back in the '60s, you know, when you had your hair teased. You know, the girls and remember this. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> now I know it's difficult to imagine, but I was never much of a fighter. <laughs> I know, looking at me today. Uh, but I had a few times in my school year, years where I remember being challenged. I remember in fourth grade a kid named Victor Panza. I can't remember what I did. We we're just in our fourth grade class, and he said, "Walker, after school, I'm going to beat you up." <laughs> he was Italian. Yeah, it's kind of an Italian thing. Yeah. <laughs> So I remember right after school, 
in this old school building. I'd, I'd run and find, all the kids would be, the bell would ring and all the kids would be in the hallways and I would find my brother who was in fifth grade and I'd say, feed your pants, threatening to beat me up. And then the two of us would run. Now, I don't know why, there are two of us, but anyway, we, we would go up the hill. In Pennsylvania, it's just like um, yeah. uh, San Francisco, where they, you, know, you, you go up a hill and then there'd be a landing and then more of a hill and a landing and all these houses were on that hill and we would we'd go up through all these backyards to avoid Victor. But one time in sixth grade, I was in a country school, and a kid said, I've been fighting on the playground, and I couldn't get out of it because it was right during school. So during our afternoon recess, this kid and I get into this fight, and you know, the kids are all gathered around, and we start, you know, hitting each other and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, 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 you know, I gave it my all, my all, I mean, I just did the very best I could to defend myself. Uh -huh. And I would have won, except she was a lot bigger and stronger. <laughs> but I took my chin and I rammed it into her fist. I mean, I... <laughs> what a man. So, and that's no lie. Yeah, I wouldn't lie to you. Now, Goliath is challenging these Israelites, and he's saying, okay, we're going to have a schoolyard fight. And in verse 11, we hear this. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now, most of us have never had a nine and a half foot giant uh, challenging us, uh, but we've all faced giant challenges, haven't we? Oh, yeah. yeah, there's things, that, and they scare you. You know, they challenge you. And at my age, I've faced many. You know, I was out of work. I always told this a number of times for a full year without steady work, and that's that can be a very, very scary thing. And you know how that is, health issues. So, I'll tell you something. Fear of the worst is worse than the actual enemy. Fear of what can happen. Yeah. Can we all think about things we were scared to death of that either never materialized or when they did materialize they weren't anywhere as bad as what we thought they were going to be. So, these Israelites are scared to death of this enemy. And in verse 12, now David was the son of the Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Now, God wants us to see something very, very important here. Because we're told that the three oldest sons and the eldest son in those days was you expected the most of. He was the one who got most of the inheritance. He was the one that everybody looked up to. But we're, we're told about them being, these are the three men, the three oldest sons of Jesse are with Saul. But David, if you remember, David played the harp. And he would go to the palace and from time to time and he would play the harp to soothe Saul when this demonic attack would happen to Saul. So it says he went back and forth. But he, he's talking about the eldest and the youngest. And we're to see... That, that God is no respecter of persons and that God will deliberately choose, and we'll look at this in a moment, uh, the least likely, the least likely. Verse 16, for 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now the number 40 is mentioned 146 times in scripture and it's usually associated with testing. Remember the flood, how many days did it rain? 40. And 40 nights, 40 days, 40 nights. Moses, when he slew the uh, Egyptian that was beating the Israel slave, Israeli slave, he was out in the wilderness after that for 40 years. Jesus spent 40 days fasting, not eating and not drinking, and he was tempted during that time. And the Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness. This is all associated with testing. 17, now, Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your, your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel. 
in the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. In other words, he's sending a, a care package to these men in battle. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. When you're being attacked, it's chronic. Yeah, every day, every day, every day, this same situation is going on. Goliath is shouting his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now, what jumps out there is that Goliath is shouting his defiance, which he does every single day, but the Holy Spirit makes sure that it says David heard it. Now, people, they all heard it. What's that mean, that David heard it? It means that David had some Holy Spirit backbone. All these others were hearing this day after day, but David really heard it. Mm. And I'll tell you something, you know, a lot of you know, I, uh, because I shared it with the church, about, you know, I've been incensed when I see uh, that there's no pushback going on in the Christian culture many, many times. We see rights stripped away. We see uh, the LGBT community uh, deliberately going to a baker and saying, bake this cake for our wedding, and then taking them to court, and all these things that have gone on time and time and time again. And so, you know, I shared with you that Heidi Harris was fired last September, a conservative talk show host, for making a conservative biblical comment on her Facebook page on the radio station, and she was fired for that. So I immediately, when I read this in the paper and saw it on the news, I immediately uh, sent an email to the editor thinking, they're just going to be barraged by, by letters. And they did print my letter, but there weren't other letters. You know, <coughs> thinking, why aren't there more Christians standing up, standing, you know, and pushing back? So David heard it. That's the kind of, we need that kind of Holy Spirit backbone. Our culture wouldn't look the way it does if more people heard, really heard, and then acted on it, as we're going to see David doing. And the scene's kind of comic because the rest of the army just keeps running away every single day. You know, It's like the Italians during the Second World yeah. War. You know, one day they're with Hitler, and the next day they're with the Allies. You, know. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. you ever see, you ever go to the ocean, and I would get a kick out of these little birds, that the ocean will, yeah, the wave will go out, and then these little birds, they trot up on the wet sand, and then the wave comes in, they, they run away. Or little toddlers will do the same thing. Yeah. They, they, they go up as the wave's pulling out, and then it's coming in, they squeal, and they run away. And that's what's going on with this uh, Israelite army. Ah, boy. Uh, verse 25. Now the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. Boy, that should have been incentive right there. <laughs> David asked the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? See, it's a disgrace, people. It's a disgrace when an enemy, an, uh, an, a, a pagan enemy, defies the standards of God. Who will do, who's going to remove this disgrace? And then he says this. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now Amen. that is Holy Spirit backbone. Amen. And in the light of the climate in this camp of Israel, what God saw in this boy David makes us understand why he anointed him to be the next king of Israel. This kid is anywhere between 12 and somewhere in his teens because uh, military age was 20 in Israel. So we know he's under 20. But you know, look at teenagers. They're scrawny little things, you know. You know. I used to have this like 30 inch waist. Yeah. 
I weighed 160 pounds in high school at 62. That's starvation, you know. And I ate just like I do now. I'm much higher than you, and I was 175 all my life until age 48. Uh oh. Yeah. Well, then it kicks in. Yeah. yeah. Party's up. Uh, party's over. Okay. So. <laughs> David said, who is this man? He's, he, he's not going to deal with it. He, he's a kid. And he says, enough is enough. And this is how we defeat giants in our life. Whenever obstacles come our way. We recognize when something uncircumcised is coming against us. When we belong to God. You never have a testimony without a test. I say that various times. It's not original. Never have a testimony without a test. Jim Pop had a test. Gonna, this is Jim, Jim's second week of being used as a sermon illustration. <laughs> but back in April, he had uh, his, his work cut his hours. So, you know, that always will stir a person up. You know, when all of a sudden your income gets challenged. So, you know, of course he was down in the mouth. That's the natural first thing to be, is, dis is discouraged. But I told Jim and... Uh, Shirley was, you know, she was saying the same thing in Fran, you know, hey, we're, hey, we're in this together, we're, we're going to be fine. I said, look at every positive thing that's going on in your life. You know, you're healthy, you've got some income, you know, all this, kind of, and then we just prayed because this was one of those uncircumcised things. And it's been a few months, but they just restored his hours. Another one's down, another one's gone. Another thing bites the dust. There. <laughs> Verse 27, they repeated to him, to David, what they've been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's older brother, oldest brother, heard him speaking with the man, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. You know, the enemy, when, when you are being challenged by whatever giant it is, will always belittle you. And sometimes it will come from other people, a family member, somebody at work. Often it's just what is played in your head. And what is played in your head is not always your own thoughts. Because the Holy Spirit speaks in a still small voice. And the evil spirits will often do the same thing. Tell you what an illusion you are. Notice how when, when, when we read a little earlier in this chapter that David left his flocks, it doesn't say his few flocks, but the brother says, yeah, your, your few flocks. Who, who'd you leave them with? Out, out in the desert. You know? Just make you feel small. And don't think that whenever you are serving God that everybody's going to applaud you because it, you know it just doesn't work that way. You're going to have criticism, and sadly, often it comes from other Christians. And we can see why God rejected Eliab as the oldest son. Remember when Samuel came to anoint one of the sons of Jesse? He assumed it would be Eliab, the oldest. And they went down the line through seven other men. And they were all out of choices. And then Samuel said, well, do you have any other sons? Well, yeah, there's, there's David, the kid, out in the flock. You know, that was the one. Hmm. Isn't that great? Now this one. So, Eliab criticizes David, and we see David saying back in verse 29, Now what have I done? Said David. You ever say that? Now what have I done? Yeah. Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else. Man, that's the smart thing to do, yes. people, with critics. Turn away yes. and just ignore it and move yes. on. Amen. And brought up the same matter, and the man answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. That's positive talk. Don't be discouraged. That's what we talked about a few weeks ago. Always look for the silver lining, you know, as much as you can. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. And he has been a fighting man from his youth. Now I can't fault Saul for saying this. You know, we've all seen people that were going to enter some venture and we just shook our heads and said, eh, I don't know how this is going to work out. You know? <laughs> yeah. 
it only makes sense. You know, this Saul is a that's a giant, he's a warrior, he's a fighter, and we're looking at a kid who wants to come up against him. Saul sees a boy, but God sees something else. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong people. We're a church full of foolish and weak people. And we glory in that. Yeah, really. Because the Apostle Paul, I mean, who, did, who has done more in the kingdom of God outside of Jesus than the Apostle Paul? Colon. But Paul said, yeah, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Wow. And it can take quite a long time for most of us to realize that, that we aren't the supermen. You know, <laughs> God has to put us in these positions where we realize our need is for Him. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, Robert uh, mentioned a guy named, by the name of Todd White. And I Googled this guy, and he's a guy with these dreadlocks. And, and, uh, and anyway, I started checking on, on this guy. And then I went home and I found that I had uh, his testimony recorded on a show called Table, uh, Joni's Table Talk or something. Oh, wow. So anyway, it was, it's amazing. This kid who was an atheist, a drug addict, um, eventually came to Jesus, came to know the Lord. And he just began to, to believe the scriptures. You know, that said, in my name they will cast out demons, they will uh, speak in new tongues, they will lay their hands on sick people, and they will get well. So he began praying for people, just going out on the streets, and he said he would pray for, you know, many, many people on the streets, and he did this day after day. His wife wouldn't go out shopping with him because he'd go and, and pray for this one in a wheelchair and pray for this one, and he wouldn't see any results. He said for like three and a half months he didn't see any results. And then all of a sudden he began to get words of knowledge. He be began to know things about people that, that he just couldn't figure out how he knew that this man had two herniated discs and you know, this and that and the other thing. And, and he's, so anyway, he's got this powerful, amazing testimony. But, but he's so unlikely, even he says it himself, you know, he is not a, a likely subject to be, he just believed. He had Holy Spirit backbone. Texan Gidget. I'd like to throw them out. You, should get, you two should get some extra potatoes. And Jim, you two for uh, being used. Uh, <laughs> but these people you know, really came to know the Lord in their seven, past 70. And all the ministries they have, their little video ministry, and they, they do some things within this, this, this church. And anybody else would say, no, oh, they should be retired. You shouldn't even be thinking of stuff like that. You know, how can God use? You know, but God uses... It doesn't, it's re, irrespective of age, of qualifications, of anything. And here's little David. And Saul is saying to him, yeah, this, you know, you shouldn't even go after this man. And in verse 34 it says, But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Then it turned on me. When it turned to me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine, you know what that reminds me of? This, the David referring to this Goliath. Everybody else is scared to death of. He's this big warrior. And David just keeps referring to him as the uncircumcised Philistine. Rocket man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pocahontas. Hey. <laughs> you know, that's not a bad idea, people. You should call, call it like it is. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, like the lion of the river, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the, and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. The paw of the lion and the paw of the bear remind me of that little dog out west who walked into the saloon with his little front leg in a, in a cast, and he said, I'm here to get the guy who shot my paw. Oh. <laughs> I bet you Kevin Oder never gets a good joke like that at Candy Ridge. That's all I'm saying. That's better. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> 
But David does something very wise here. He recalls what God has done in the past for him. Hey, I did this, this happened. When God, and that's what we, you and I need to do when we're in a battle with something. When the enemy is coming against us, we need to go back in time. Because our memories are short. So you need to go to a refresher course and say, okay, how about this time God brought us through God brought us through this. Stephanie had a scary thing. She went for a breast exam. Uh -oh. And the lady who examines her, they are her regular doctor, uh, found something suspicious. She said, I want you to have a, a 3D ultrasound. And Stephanie said, well, should, should I have that? You know, so she was shaken up. Uh -huh. And she said, should, should I have it before we do a little vacation? I said, yeah. Yeah, because otherwise it's going to be, heck. she said, because, you know, it could, it could end our vacation if they find something, you know, scary or real, you know, cancer, let's call it what it is. So I said, yes. So she went and had uh, this 3D ultrasound and, um, or mammogram, and um, that was on a Monday, and then we had to wait till Friday for the results. So, mm. you know, we just had to go before God and, and stand our, our ground and, and uh, you know, count on Him to be our, our defense. And thank God uh, it came back. Everything was, was fine. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So, anyway, David remembers that. I, had a, I met with a guy this week that, you know, uh, from time to time uh, I just kind of counsel him. And he was talking about he had some temptations. And, and you know, the temptations, if, if anybody's come out of an ugly area, uh, uh, they can be very, very strong, and, and they will destroy us, you know, if we, when we give in to things, drug addiction, whatever the thing is. And uh, what made me feel really good was that he said, I, I was so tempted to act out, and he said, but I remembered all the mess I, I'd been in before. And that memory kept him from acting, yeah. So, the, so it's very good to remember what God has done and how messy things can do if we can be if we do them on our own. So he remembered. Where did David get this audacity to face this giant so confidently and courageously? Well, in 1 Samuel 16, 13, we read this. When Samuel went to anoint the next king of Israel among Jesse's sons, and it turns out to be David, it says, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. That's why the jealousy people mm -hmm. from Eliab. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Backbone. Holy Spirit backbone. Now, we think, was that an individual case? No, because in Acts 1.8, it says for us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Witnesses. Of all those in Israel, the whole army, who do you think was a good witness for God? David! Yep. The kid! kid. Huh. And the world, when the world sees a Christian facing a giant problem and responding to that problem with Holy Spirit backbone, let me tell you, is that a witness for God? Yes. yes. Here, Cheryl, you take these five pounds of potatoes because I'm going to brag on Cheryl. Ah. Hey, Cheryl. You know, I don't use Cheryl as a sermon illustration often enough. But I've seen, you know, Cheryl's been part of my life for quite a number of years, at least 20 years, and been part of this church since we opened the doors 14 plus years ago now. And you know, I watched her as her husband Dick was going through cancer and, and how she, you know, we'd see times where Dick would, would be here in church and other times he'd come to church and he'd have to lie on a couch in the back and other times he couldn't make it at all. And that went on for years as she faced that. And then the death of her husband and widowhood and, and, and problems that I'm not even aware of, issues. But you know what? Cheryl always comes in here. She's always upbeat, yep. her eyes sparkle, yep. and that's Holy Spirit backbone, and I have to It's a witness. It's a good witness. Verse 38. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. 
I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Don't you love that? Now that's where you get back to those flannel board memories, right? <laughs> the slingshot, the stones. And let me just pause here to say that there's another great illustration there, that you can't wear somebody's armor. Yep. It's not going to work the same way. You, you know, we can look at people and be inspired by them, but, but to try to imitate them, you know, pastors go through this all the time because we compare ourselves with what's going on over in this ministry and this church and its size and all the things that they're doing, this, 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 this. But I'll tell you, God had to say to me, you're not designed to run their churches. I've designed you to run this church. You know, I can't put that armor on. It's way, way too heavy and it doesn't work. Meanwhile, verse 41, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. Let me tell you something. Satan hates your guts. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is never going to be your friend, and he's never going to leave you alone. He despises you. He said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields. The giant will always do his best to scare you. Yeah. And to make you feel like this thing is just going to kill me. <laughs> I had for years, I had the fear uh, of my inward struggle that I was going through. I'm not going to get into my testimony. But I could not let my sister and brother know about it because I was close with them, I loved them, and I had this fear that they would reject me if they knew I was human. Mm -hmm. And when I finally did, years and years into the struggle, which brought me so much freedom, once there were other people involved, it was just like those cartoons where you see you're, they're, they're in a cave and you see this uh, dragon yeah. coming at somebody, the shadow of a dragon, and you find out it's a mouse. Yep. And I thought, all these wasted years of living in fear of something that really was not a giant. It was a mouse. David said to the Philistine, verse 45, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Don't you love being politically incorrect you know yes. this day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into his hands listen yes. David spoke at that moment in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt. Zechariah 4, 6 says this, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And God will keep putting us and allowing us to go through various situations to prove exactly that. Just like, again, Jim's cut ours. You know, you just have to stand strong in the Lord until the deliverance comes because he's fighting the battle. Listen, giant slayers, Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Then, and then I like this. I love that verse, but right after it says, He will drive out your enemies before you, saying, destroy them. You know, God is a God of love, but don't push Him. You know, the Bible says, God is not mocked. Mocked. He's not mocked. And he won't allow us to be defied who stand in his name. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Before we glory. <laughs> now we, need, we need some um, Indiana Jones music coming up here. <laughs> As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, verse 48, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. That's interesting that we're told he moved quickly. God Adam. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling 
and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. What a difference. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharon Rain Road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem and he put the Philistine's weapon in his own tent. Ba -ba -da -ba, ba -ba -da. It's a moment. You know, what a difference there is in facing something in the name of the Lord. What a testimony that is. All these other men, hundreds of them, maybe thousands in the Israeli army, they were running from this one guy day after day, day after day, and it takes one, one young man with Holy Spirit background, but backbone, the least likely, the least likely. Wow. So people, those of you that feel least likely, that feel weak, God is, has the battle in his hands. Amen. Let me close with Deuteronomy 28.7. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. Let's close in prayer. Lord, this is a message every one of us needs to hear. And even those of us who may currently not be facing some giant issue going on right now that's challenging us and scaring us and shaking our faith, Lord, but Father, you have shown us not only through this illustration, but through your word again and again that you fight the battle for us. And as we just read, Father, when those enemies come at us one way, they'll flee away in seven other directions. So Father, I pray, Lord, that, that you stir hearts today and that you give each one in this room Holy Spirit backbone to face the challenges, the enemies, and the giants in our lives. Lord, we are thankful that you are bigger than any obstacle or any problem or any challenge. We love you, Father, and we do leave this place, Lord, in your peace and with your joy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. If anybody has a prayer need or a, you know, wants to share anything, I'm here. So... Uh, there are others here, some of our other prayer warriors are in the house, so uh, send. I just wanted to give Eric some thanks, like his stuff he did at test. My daughter then told me that there was something, you know, in the middle. Right. And she had to take it out and had a surgery. So we went to another doctor and um, they said no. I need some free. These are um, fibers that will melt on their own once you take care of your diet. Mm -hmm. And oh, wow. Wow. Yes. Yes. oh, amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. amen. Thank you for sharing that, Joseph. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Have a great week. If you can uh, join us on Wednesday, we'd love to have you.